Hello and welcome back to Malopathy Matters, the official podcast of the charity Malopathy.org. Where we talk all things degenerative cervical myelopathy from the perspective of the professionals, the researchers and the people living with myelopathy. I'm Ewan Sadler, a person with DCM and a founder of Malopathy.org. And I'm Ben Davies, neurosurgeon scientist and also founder of Myelopathy.org. This is Myelopathy Matters. So a fascinating topic to discuss today with two guests from the United States, the Medical College of Wisconsin. And spoiler alert, these researchers were selected for a piece of research conducted in 2023 for the myelopathy.org research award. And the question they were looking at was whether breathing is affected in degenerative cervical myelopathy. Now, whilst the cervical spinal cord is known to have an important role Uh, anatomically at least in the control of breathing unlike its close relation traumatic spinal cord injury where we see in hospitals quite profound impacts on breathing in dcm breathing hadn't really got much attention or really been a focus of of measurement or or research now that is a surprise because from the support group breathing is definitely one symptom that often comes up and that causes a lot of discussion at the moment when people ask Can DCM cause these other symptoms? I point them to the DCM video you made explaining that the spinal cord is the junction box. Yes, and and I think it's certainly anatomically possible, but it certainly wasn't on my radar at all. And it was really only working with the community through the AO Spine Recode DCM project when As you recall, we were trying to establish what should be measured in research trials, and we were asking very open questions to people living with the condition about how they were affected, that I started to hear this theme of of breathing. But I think it's it's one thing to sort of be able to describe a problem and and maybe, you know, suggest why, you know, simplistically the spinal cord is a junction box, but very different to actually be truly able to explain why and if that is occurring. And that's what's so fascinating about the research that's been chosen for the Marlopi.org Research Award. Yeah, brilliant. And so, who are our guests today then, Ben? Well, we're joined by Drs. Aditya Vedantam and Kajana Satkunendran Raja from the recently established Centre for Cervical Myelopathy at the Medical College of Wisconsin in the United States. Aditya is a surgeon scientist and director of the centre, and Kajana leading one of the laboratories in that centre, preclinical scientist herself. I like the sound of that, Centre for Cervical Myelopathy. That must be a first. Yes, I think this could be the first ever university to create a dedicated multidisciplinary DCM research institute. Really exciting. And it, actually, that was the first question I put to Aditya. How did this centre come about? Well, I'd like to welcome Aditya and Kajana to the Myelopathy Matters podcast. Welcome both. So perhaps, Aditya, I can start with yourself and Perhaps you can tell us what got you interested in degenerative cervical myelopathy, and I guess particularly led to the creation of the Center for Cervical Myelopathy. Yes, I think, uh, thank you again, Ben, and the team for having us. My interest in cervical myelopathy, I think, started in medical school. My dad is a neurosurgeon, and he got me involved in one of his research projects dealing with uh, persons with cervical myelopathy. Actually, that's one of the first papers I published. But after that, I did a postdoc here at the medical college where we used advanced MRI for cervical myelopathy, and then in residency and in um, fellowship uh, where now I am a spine neurosurgeon, I uh, found that it is a big part of my practice, and uh, there definitely is a need for um, improving the care for these persons through research as well as other uh, clinical techniques. So this really got me interested in cervical myelopathy. Uh, regards to the Center for Cervical Myelopathy, I, um, you know, once I started my job as faculty here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, I looked around at other um, uh, disease conditions and I found that, you know, the really the, the one way to advance care is through uh, multidisciplinary teams. And what we know with cervical myelopathy, at least in the past, is that, is that it's uh, the research has been primarily surgeon-led, and uh, that has led to an increased focus only on the surgical techniques. In a way, I feel that may have contributed to the limited progress we've had for this uh, condition. So uh, we, uh, I wanted to create a center that uh, brings all these uh, different experts, uh, physicians, scientists, and patients together under one umbrella. Could you give us a bit more detail on how that came about? Because I think what you've created is something at the moment truly very unique. Uh, that is correct. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, it, uh, to my knowledge, at least, it's one of the first of its kind in the United States or even in North America. 
we um, what I noticed here at the medical college is that we have a rich history of spine research. And uh, we have different experts in imaging, um, biomedical engineering, or physical therapists, uh, as well as basic scientists who do work uh, in the realm of cervical myelopathy. And uh, some of these experts also work uh, with spinal cord injury. And so there is some overlap as well. I got them all together. I re reached out and we had thought about it a little bit on what the focus should be. And uh, we created the center with three main areas of focus, uh, one being research, uh, clinical care, as well as uh, education. It's still, still very, very broad. Is there any sort of particular focus, I guess, if we pick around the research bit about how or where you want to apply your resources and expertise? Yes, I think in the, on the research side, again, there's the clinical research and animal research. On the clinical research side, I think one area that we're trying to focus on is looking at ways to augment recovery. And uh, we know surgery does help for DCM, but uh, there are limits and uh, there are, at the moment, no other novel therapies to augment recovery beyond surgery. So that's really one big area of focus on the research side. And we're trying to use some of the animal studies to kind of uh, develop some translational techniques that can help this area. Kujana, perhaps I can come come now to you and sort of understand more about, you know, how you became interested in cervical myelopathy and got involved with this this Centre for Cervical Myelopathy. I'm really excited to be sharing some of our thoughts. And uh, really my first introduction to myelopathy was during my uh, postdoctoral fellowship in Toronto with uh, Dr. Michael Failings. Uh, Interestingly, I had uh, worked and completed my PhD on spinal cord injury prior to joining uh, Michael Failings. However, I had not heard of uh, cervical myelopathy. It hadn't entered my sphere of interest until then. And during early in my fellowship, um, I collaborated with uh, Dr. Jengbo Lee, a neurosurgeon from Korea, developing a model of DCM. It was through this involvement in this project that I was truly introduced to the intricacies of DCM. It gave me a lot of questions and, and I was really surprised to find out how prevalent uh, DCM is compared to other spinal cord disorders. And that really was uh, my initial introduction and what sparked my interest uh, in DCM. And then what led to the transfer from Canada then down, down to the US and uh, Medical College of Wisconsin? As uh, Aditya mentioned, uh, MCW has a very rich history of spine research. During um, my transition from uh, fellowship and as a, from a scientist in Toronto to looking for my own faculty and starting my own lab, Medical College of Wisconsin seemed, uh, the, like, seemed like the next logical step with uh, not only spinal cord injury research, but it really combined two of my major interests in DCM. There's many researchers, not just clinicians, but also basic scientists focused on DCM. So that was one of my big draws to establish my lab at the Medical College of Wisconsin, which happened about four and a half, five years ago. And, and where did this sort of focus then, as we're going to discuss your, your recent publication, uh, the award-winning publication around the breathing, how did that interest and focus on, on respiration come about? It was during uh, my time uh, in Toronto while I was working on, I worked on a few models of DCM. What really astonished me was that uh, I was simultaneously working on both traumatic and non-traumatic DCM type of injuries of the cervical spinal cord. And despite having a significant tissue damage um, caused by the compression in myelopathy, the DCM, animal models of DCM, didn't have much respiratory deficits. Um, so they would function in terms of, for all intents and purposes of looking at it kind of grossly, they seem to have normal breathing function. While even a mild uh, injury to the cervical spinal cord, if it was traumatic, would lead to significant deficits in breathing. So this is really what sparked my initial curiosity about what's happening with the respiratory network in DCM. And if you look at the patient population, it's not something that uh, we see in the clinics. So there was um, something that was happening that seemed to be very specific to DCM. So there's a loss of tissue and neurons that potentially are related to breathing, but still the animals and the patients are able to maintain breathing. That really what got me interested in the phenomenon of breathing in DCM. And then that led to the seminal publication in 2018, where we demonstrated 
unlike traumatic spinal cord injury, DCM has significant amount of plasticity because of the nature of the disease, that it's a progressive compression that happens over a long period of time, allowing for the neural networks in the cervical spinal cord to undergo rewiring and plasticity that it maintains breathing. And as you know, breathing is so dynamic. We take our first breath at the time of birth and this function continues without break throughout life. The question was, why do we lose other functions like our hand function, forelimb function, and um, gait deficits, yet breathing is not that affected? So that really was the impetus for figuring out what the network um, and how the network is rewiring. And that led us to discover there, there's a population of interneurons that's mediating a lot of this plasticity. And um, so this was published in 2018. And coming to the current publication, we showed that DCM, the model of DCM, as well as patients are able to maintain breathing, but this is under resting condition. Is it the same if we expose um, DCM patients or the mice to some sort of a respiratory challenge, as in strenuous exercise, or if they go under anesthesia. So that was kind of my interest in DCM and breathing. I'm just interested to understand how that hypothesis came about, because in the 2018 publication you mentioned, you'd shown that conservation of, of respiratory function. So what made you think that, that a respiratory uh, challenge, if you like, the increased CO2 levels might be something that reveal the difference in this population of, of people? We know that breathing is very dynamic. It changes constantly to adapt to our activity levels and the state of the animal and also just uh, our emotions. So we know that there is a network that's able to adapt our breathing to based on our needs. Although we showed that breathing is maintained at a normal level, under evening conditions, that is resting conditions. When the network is compromised, we showed that that's part of the neural network is damaged, yet they're able to adapt and maintain adequate ventilation. So does that mean they're tapping into a system that is reserved to enhance ventilation under respiratory challenge? And if so, then if that's already tapped into the reserve network, Will we be able to increase breathing if DCM patients or DCM animal models are exposed to a challenge? So that was really the hypothesis. And our belief was that since the reserve network is already under utilized to maintain normal breathing, they may not be available to respond to respiratory challenges. And that was really the hypothesis behind the study. Fascinating. So perhaps we can get into some details then of, of the study. And I think it'd be helpful for the listeners just to understand a bit more about the mouse model and how you bring about cervical myelopathy uh, in, in the mouse. So the cervical myelopathy happens through multiple conditions. And now we have a global term DCM, degenerative cervical myelopathy. And the model that we use is uh, a chronic and a progressive compression at the level of C4, 5, 6. And so to do this, we um, remove the ligamentum flavum and insert a piece of aromatic polyether underneath without doing a laminectomy. And what this material does is um, it serves as a scaffold and precipitates inorganic salts like calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate thus creating, um, creating a progressive increase in the pressure on the cervical spinal cord. And it really mimics the clinical picture of what we see in DCM patients. So it progressively compresses the spinal cord over a long period of time, and it replicates the clinical picture. That is, they develop gait deficits, loss of dexterity, and uh, some um, bowel and bladder dysfunction. Using different material, we can create a different severities of compression and different progression. And this is the model that we use to address the question in our hypothesis. So what did you find then in this study? 
So we used this model and we created the uh, compression and we progressively monitored the breathing function over time. And to do this, we used a uh, whole body plethysmography, which is essentially airtight chamber in which we put, placed the mice. And um, the changes in pressure uh, due to natural breathing can be measured. And this allows us to measure things such as tidal volume, minute ventilation, and respiratory frequency. And uh, what we found was that over time, as the progression of the compression increases, we do not see a significant um, decline in respiratory function over the course of about 12 weeks. However, at 12 weeks, if we expose these mice to a hypercapnic challenge, that is, we increase, um, we flood the tight airtight chamber with a hypercapnic mixture of airflow, which has 7% CO2, mimicking a hypercapnic condition. And a normal mouse that has not undergone a DCM surgery will respond to this gas challenge by increasing their ventilation. However, DCM mice fail to have that same amount of response. So their hypercapnic ventilatory response is significantly blunted. So what this showed us was that at 12 weeks when DCM has significantly progressed, they're unable to respond to these respiratory challenges. And interestingly, we wanted to test, uh, we know that even though um, decompressive surgery is not 100% successful, it does improve motor outcome. So what we wanted to see next was, if we were to do a decompressive surgery on these mice, can we improve their ability to respond to respiratory challenge? To our surprise, um, the mice were not able to respond. In fact, none of the mice that underwent a surgical decompression were able to respond to hypercapnic ventilatory challenge as sham animals that had not been exposed to DCM surgery. So to our surprise, decompressive surgery leads to better outcomes in hand function and gait function, but unable to improve um, their ability to respond to hypercapnic ventilatory response. I thought this was a really striking finding, and partly because I've sort of spent some time reflecting on it and trying to explain why. And I'm, I've struggled to find an answer I, I like the sound of. I don't know if you're, you've given it, obviously, presumably more thought. And why do you think this is happening? Under DCM, the network that's being utilized is not able to enhance further to be able to respond to this hypercapnic challenge. while other functions, there is some reserve capacity or networks and pathways from either brainstem or brain network that um, are recovering after decompressive surgery that allows them to recover while in breathing, the network may be already com compromised or being utilized for maintaining eupneic breathing. Is it able to detect the difference whether this is a sensory issue or a motor issue you think it's a motor function that, that they can't respond is that is that clear is it there's ongoing la uh, work in our lab that's looked at the involvement of spinal interneurons in this plasticity so in 2018 what we showed was that significant portion of the plasticity that's maintaining breathing in dcm is mediated by spinal interneurons and specifically excitatory interneurons our hypothesis uh, currently is that these interneurons receive descending input from brainstem that's involved in breathing. These same network is involved in the hypercapnic ventilatory response. So we think that the excitability of these interneurons, which then have an effect on the motor outcome, is um, hyper excitable, or if you can think about it as um, it's undergone molecular plasticity to enhance outcome. That's maybe underlying the changes that we're saying. And in terms of sensory, we do think that there is some sensory input into these interneurons that could be affected, that even with the decompressive surgery, it may not be restored to the same level as in the previous case. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess a final question, I mean, because obviously the outcomes in the animal model, I believe, were 12 weeks after the surgery, is that correct? 
the decompression was done at 12 weeks post-surgery. Uh, and how long did you f follow the mice? I guess my question is, you know, do you think there is an element that this is a recovery is going to take longer? Or you think this is a situation where there is no no more recovery to give? Well, I think we waited for 12, uh, 12 weeks to do the decompressive surgery after the initial implantation of the material to induce DCM. And following decompression surgery, we waited for about six weeks to look at their recovery pattern. We could wait longer to see if there would be more recovery, but our thoughts are that perhaps we should be looking at ways to enhance this intrinsic plasticity or perhaps train this network to be able to enhance their ability to respond to respiratory challenge. Or if we could understand what some of the supraspinal input into this uh, cervical network, then maybe those may be the way to target an enhanced recovery. Maybe it's a good segue back to Aditya here then. I guess, you know, from your perspective and that of a clinician as well, you know, why did you find this question so important to, to pursue? You know, what do you think are the translational benefits uh, from this sort of research? Yeah, I think um, the um, fact is that DCM uh, seems to have multiple effects on human physiology. And as surgeons, we focus on the sensory motor function, maybe the bowel and bladder function, uh, but we don't uh, think about respiration a lot. I think there have been papers from both Japan and India showing uh, that respiratory function is decreased in, D in DCM. And then uh, after surgery, there is an improvement you see clinically, but uh, these subclinical deficits uh, don't improve to the level that healthy controls do. Uh, I need to acknowledge that respiratory issues are subclinical. In the vast majority of patients that I see, um, I don't see them complaining of overt respiratory issues. But uh, the findings of this research, I think, are relevant in certain subgroups. Um, so one is older patients who have uh, significant respiratory comorbidities. Now, if you take them for surgery, uh, they can have issues with emergence and extubation after anesthesia, especially those surgeons, uh, those um, patients who um, undergo a long uh, prone surgeries where they're prone. So um, I think those are definitely some um, you know, clinical um, applications of these findings. Uh, I think those patients are some, they may need to be counseled about, um, you know, so perioperative morbidity for uh, their DCM surgery. One of the things I, that it made me, me think about, and I guess you can come in here, we've had this increasing recognition that there is this deep issue of fatigue in, in myelopathy. The patients bring that to our attention. They talk about this scenario, for example, where they can have a very a day which is slightly more exertional than normal. And then the following day, they have this payback, they call it, um, where they sort of feel like they've run a marathon. And there's a big question of what the biological basis is of that fatigue. But you know, it just makes me wonder a little bit whether this could be a contributing factor. You know, If they cannot respond appropriately physiologically to that increased demand, maybe this is one of the reasons they are feeling that sort of implications, I guess. That's a good point, uh, Ben. Yes, I, I think that um, I have uh, heard that from a few patients. Um, most of them have been the ones who have had surgery, and I think uh, sometimes I attribute it to the anesthesia and, you know, the long uh, uh, surgical intervention. But um, uh, certainly something like this could affect your, you know, uh, basic uh, met metabolism and whether it can actually ramp up and respond to uh, challenges due to exercise or increased exertion. Um, and this may be a factor. I think what we're learning is the uh, cervical spinal cord is definitely the... Um, output pathway to the rest of the body. And so multiple functions are likely affected in cervical myelopathy. And uh, I think it's research like this that gives us more insight into all the other symptoms that many patients uh, complain about or they report, but as surgeons, we don't um, give, put a lot of emphasis on. And if I may add, um, I think that's a similar observation in the lab. We noticed that uh, compared to normal mice that go under anesthesia for the first time, versus DCM mice, they tend to have difficulty uh, maintaining a level plane of anesthesia and breathing difficulties. So when their respiratory system is challenged, they're not able to respond as a normal mouse. And so we felt it was an important question clinically because um, not only in older patients, but you know the lifespan is expanding and people want to maintain active lives, even with DCM, to be able to have undergo physical therapy or strenuous exercise, we need our respiratory system to be able to adapt to that increased demand. 
And definitely, as Ben said, I think the fatigue that you see, this could be an underlying mechanism why there may be more fatigue in DCM patients. So where do you want this research to go next, uh, Kajana? I want to pursue uh, in line of uh, spinal interneurons and the plasticity to see what exactly is changing. So ultimately, the goal is to target this plasticity, but not just for breathing, but also to expand it to um, for hand function and gait function to see if we can tap into this plasticity that we see in the respiratory network to see if we can adapt some of these mechanisms, find interventions that we can introduce for other networks to be able to improve outcome after surgical intervention for DCM. You know, I think the one of the big takeaways from this study is that we have now an animal model that can really replicate the human phenotype, uh, both for motor function as well as respiratory function. Uh, and I think this is particularly valuable. As you know, the field has um, uh, has been limited largely by a lack of good animal models. And so we were forced to kind of study human subjects, but, uh, you know, the disease is slowly progressive. And so it requires a lot of time and uh, very, and just really hard to do, you know, uh, laboratory investigations when it's only human studies. So uh, this uh, research uh, shows that we have an animal model that is, um, that could be used for a number of translational methods. And I think one of them is, as Kajana mentioned, uh, would be to look at how we can really augment recovery. I think we can do the decompression, and perhaps there are other techniques that we can use to uh, harness the effects of those interneurons and the plasticity uh, to augment uh, neurological recovery. Very, very exciting. Well, I, I would like to finish really by congratulating you both again for the fantastic contribution. and. Um, uh, our chair of trustees couldn't join us uh, uh, today to, for this recording, but really to pass on uh, our thanks and, and congratulate you on the award of the Myelopathy.org Research Award for 2023. Thank you, Ben. And also thanks for everything you do for myelopathy, um, just dissemination and also advancing the field. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, and then I need to just make a quick plug to myelopathy.org. I think your website is fantastic. And I myself do direct my patients to the website. I just open it up in clinic and I have them look at it. And uh, I think it's really been helpful to them for to understand uh, what's going on and what to expect. Well, that's brilliant feedback. Thanks both. I mean, it's a collaborative effort and no one, no, no single person can solve all of these problems. And it's uh, sort of bringing everything together in a, in a growing community, which is really, really pleasing to see. Yeah, that was another great interview. It's really exciting to hear how they look at amelopathy from a different perspective. I think you picked up on a really important link there with breathing and fatigue. You know, give me a flat surface to walk on and I'm pretty okay. Uh, give me a gradient and I'm really digging pretty deep. It makes a lot of sense. If there's a lack of oxygen hitting their muscles, the more it's going to sort of wipe you out and give you that fatigue. But broadly, the more we find out about myelopathy and the underlying symptoms, the better. I think this is definitely something that our community will be very interested in year, and I was very pleased to see that this won a research prize. What's your thoughts, Ben? Yeah, I agree, you, and it was really exciting to see and hear a fresh philosophy, you know, not just from that specific research question, but the wider setup they've created with this Centre for Cervical Myelopathy. I must sound like a broken record, but the main lesson I took away from RICO was the creative power of bringing together diverse perspectives. And I think in that centre, that's exactly what they are starting to do. And I really look forward to um, seeing and hearing the more, more of the results that will come come from it. Going back to this specific study, that there is this impaired respiratory drive, if you like, in, in people with DCM. I think there's still quite a bit more work to be done on why that's occurring. You know, the idea that DCM is gradually reducing the reserve capacity of the nervous system, we think is an important part of DCM. But what's quite different about what they've seen there is that certainly up until this point, we hadn't really identified a spinal cord function, if you like, that didn't have at least some ability to respond to the surgical treatment. If you, and if you look at that study, what they've shown is that every single rat didn't you know, despite surgery, wasn't able to have that sort of, you know, response to a buildup of CO2 that you might expect, for example, with um, 
increase activity. So it's a really start finding. And I think it's one that for me is still difficult to explain. And, and I think therefore it needs quite a little bit more interrogation into the why um, before we can really start to think about, you know, what that could mean or how we could help it. And what do you think about ADT as takeaway? That they now have a working animal model you know, of DCM. Yeah, good, good point. We mustn't overlook this. You know, I think there's obviously a lot of sensitivity around animal research, but but bottom line, it's a really essential tool for understanding a disease, you know, finding new solutions. You know, you can't dream up new drugs and just throw them at, you know, a, a whole group of, of group of patients. You know, you need to be able to test them, see that they're doing the right things. And, and that requires a lot of invasive research. So I think that is a really important step. You know, we had a look I think in about 2018 at how much animal research had ever been done in DCM across sort of 200 years of of knowing about the disease and we found I think about 50 studies which is just nothing to be honest. So it is a really foundational step and one I think that the center will be able to use and and, and expand not just to explore questions about breathing but many other uh, exciting innovations. Well, all that remains to be said is a big thank you to our guests, Aditya Vedantam and Kajana Satkanendran Raja for joining us. A big congratulations again to them for winning the Research Award for 2023. This was Myelopathy Matters from myelopathy.org. The podcast is always produced by Carl Homer from Cambridge TV. You can, of course, keep up to date with the latest in the field of degenerative cervical myelopathy by subscribing to this podcast or registering for the newsletter on our website, myelopathy.org. But please don't hesitate to get in touch with either of us. That's ben at myelopathy.org or, of course, ewan at myelopathy.org. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>